Hi, uh, so my name is Tomer Gabel. Uh, this is my first time in Belarus. Uh, been loving it so far. I've been here for two hours, I think, maybe. Um, I'm sorry for the scheduling mix up. It's, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I ended up arriving late, but uh, hopefully we can at least have some fun. What's that? Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's a 68K for those of you uh, who are interested in those sort of things. So, um, like I said, my name is Tomer Gabel. Um, you may be able to pronounce it, but don't bother because I'm from Israel. Uh, I work for a company called Wix. Um, we do have offices like nearby in, in Ukraine and in Lithuania, not unfortunately in Belarus just yet. Um, and this is the second talk in a series of things that are basically designed to uh, kind of peel off a few layers of abstraction about things that we sort of see every day. So the first talk was about storage devices, hard drives, SSDs. This one is going to be about uh, the actual CPU. Uh, luckily, this is a Java conference. The code examples are in Java, so it shouldn't be uh, a problem for you to follow. And it's very simple code, so it's also uh, pretty trivial. Um, I don't expect there to be any issues. If anyone has any questions, or if you you know want to call me out on making a mistake or tell me that I'm an idiot, you have two options. You can raise your hands, and I'll just ask you uh, what the question is. Don't be shy. Uh, there's also going to be probably plenty of uh, time for questions at the end. Uh, the other option is if you've brought vegetables, you can throw them at me. Um, but I think probably the organizers are going to be pissed off about the mess, so maybe not such a good idea. Before we begin, uh, a bit of full disclosure. CPUs are incredibly complex. I am as far from being a, an expert on the subject as it gets. Right? I'm a software engineer. I don't design hardware. I don't design CPUs. I'm just curious, and I like to learn, and hopefully some of uh, the things that I've learned that I'm going to cover here are going to be useful to you, or at least interesting. So. Because I'm not an expert, um, some of the things uh, I explain here are going to be simplified, very oversimplified, um, could be inaccurate. I might be wrong in a few occasions. I try not to be, right? I do my research, but then maybe I screwed up and some of the things I might say ended up being wrong. Uh, also, because it's such a huge topic, we're just barely going to scratch the surface, right? There's only so much you can say in 45 or 60 minutes. Um, there's a lot more to learn. There's also going to be, at the very last slide, some links to more reading materials if you're interested in the subject. And obviously, I'm happy to discuss this after the fact. So to start with, we're going to start with a puzzle. Um, and the puzzle is this. Here's, here's a bit of code. And the code looks like this. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a byte array. We're going to fill it in with random bytes, You know, just a bunch of data. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to loop over that array, and we're going to pick only the positive numbers and sum them up. Right? Just accumulate them. That's it. This is very, very, very stupid code, artificial completely. But here's the thing. This runs at a certain speed. And the question is, if we add this sort, right? if we sort the array before running the loop, there's three questions you might ask. Which version is faster? And by faster, I mean just the loop. right? We're not interested in the setup. The sort is not part of the equation. It's just the loop. Which version is faster? The second question you may ask is, by how much? And the third question, obviously, would be, why? So anyone care to take a guess? Yes, sir. So the question was, is it related to the processor cache in a way? That is, that is as good a guess as any. Um, we'll get to the answer uh, further, into the, further into the presentation. Any other guesses? Yeah? Thomas, please, please wait the microphone. So the second guess was that the sorted version is faster because of the CPU branch prediction. OK, any other guesses? That's it. OK, well, those are kind of the only two possible explanations, really, that most people uh, think about. Um, I'm going to leave the answer for later. It's not going to be surprising to some of you. Uh, but the important part is why. So it's, it's, I think it's important to understand. So the one answer I can give you is which version is actually faster. Now, um, this benchmark, this is a, a JMH benchmark result. And the code is uh, on GitHub. There will be a link later if you want to run it yourself. 
Fundamentally, um, we have the baseline version, which takes about 115 microseconds to sort through 30, uh, to sorry, loop through 32k of data. And then we have the pre-sorted version, just the loop, not the sort. And there is an order of magnitude difference, right? So those of you who guessed that the sorted version would be faster are obviously right. Those of you who guessed how much faster are probably wrong. Most people think, you know, it couldn't be that much faster. No, it's an order of magnitude. Right? This is 10 times faster, which is ridiculous. So the rest of this talk will be about you know, explaining some of these phenomena and how they can actually affect your code, whether you write it in a low-level language like C or even assembly, or you use a high-level language like Java or Python or Scala, whatever uh, the flavor of the week is. Now, the first thing to realize is that CPUs are incredibly, incredibly complex. Right? This is a, a micro uh, microscope photograph of a CPU. And it looks highly complex. This CPU is a 286. It's 30 years old, right? So as you might imagine, over 30 years, we've gone from being this complex to being insanely complex. I'm not even going to bother showing you a, a, the same image of a modern CPU, because it's so dense, you just can't tell anything. Um, so with that in mind, it is known that your high-level code, in Java as the case may be, eventually gets compiled down to assembly code, right? This is the results of the actual JVM jitter. Um, you can give it some flags to output the assembly code after optimization, after everything. This is actually about one quarter of the amount of assembly code that this loop generates. So there's a lot of uh, complexity that is hidden uh, by the compiler. But the bottom line is, the compiler ends up, or the jitter, ends up generating these assembly instructions that the CPU ends up executing. Uh, and obviously, you don't want to code your programs that way, right? There's a reason we use modern languages. There's a reason we use Java, and Java 8 is already way nicer than Java 7 ever was. Still, eventually, it ends up like this. So what is slightly less known is that your uh, assembly instructions end up in the CPU. They are not atomic, right? It's not like a monolithic thing that takes your instructions and just runs them. There's a lot of complexity behind the scenes. And the nice thing about that is, as software engineers, we're sort of used to treating, like taking problems, breaking them apart into smaller bits, treating each bit, bit of the problem separately, and then integrating the whole into a full solution to a problem. Well, it turns out that CPUs, engineering CPUs, isn't fundamentally different. You take a problem, you break it down, you integrate, you have a solution at play. So every instruction that your CPU operates, depending on the CPU architecture and how modern it is and what version it is, Intel is slightly different from AMD, obviously ARM or Motorola um, CPUs work a little bit differently. Fundamentally, all CPUs have at least these five stages in dealing with any instruction. So first of all, there's the fetch stage, right? The CPU actually needs to go to memory and read in the instruction. The second step is decoding the instruction. So the CPU have, has a look at this set of bits that comprise an assembly instruction. It decodes them. It figures out what to do. The next step is executing the instruction, actually performing the logic that is desirable, that the, the instruction semantic actually represent. Optionally, you may also need to access memory. Like if the instruction is reading off of memory, you actually have to go to the memory controller and issue an instruction to read stuff out of memory. And finally, if there's an actual effect of the instruction, and generally speaking, there's always some effect. You may be writing to a register. You may be writing to memory. Uh, you, know, you may be performing I.O. There's always some effect going on. And that is generally called a write back. So you have these five steps that are always, always, always uh, relevant to any instruction, regardless of your CPU architecture. Now, let's, let's have a quick look at, I'm just going <laughs> to disconnect this because it's driving me crazy. All right, let's have a quick look at the architecture of a CPU. And I've intentionally chosen a, a pretty old CPU. Once again, it's a 286. Right? This is the CPU diagram for a 286 CPU. And this is already simplified. Right? This is a diagram. It's not the actual thing, right? It's just a representation of what goes on in the CPU. So fundamentally, what does a CPU do, right? We've kind of covered this. It 
reads the program. It reads it off of memory. So for that, you have a unit within the CPU responsible for actually talking to main memory. For a 286, this would be called the bus unit. Next up, it figures out what the program is meant to do. That's the decode phase. For a 286, it's called an instruction unit. Then it executes the instruction. And this is where you might actually start seeing things that are familiar, right? You have the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. We're going to circle back to that in a bit, um, which is sort of the, the core of the CPU. This is the, the, um, this is the, the block within the CPU that actually does things like calculations and memory addressing and flow control and conditions and all of that stuff. The CPU may need to talk to memory. So once again, you have, uh, you have two things at play here. You have the address unit, which actually takes your memory addresses and figures out where they belong in main memory. Certainly on modern CPUs, as you well know, you don't actually uh, read from physical addresses, right? The pointers that are generated for you in Java, Java references, if you will, are not actual physical addresses within memory. They're just tags. They're mapped, right? You have virtual memory, you have paging, you have you have all that interesting stuff going on, you have a unit within the CPU responsible for that. Uh, for the 286, it's called an address unit, and it's very, very simple. Modern CPUs are obviously way more complex. Finally, you may need to perform I.O. Like, you have your CPU, and it's reading off of memory and doing things. Eventually, you're going to want to write it out to, you know, to video card memory, or you want to uh, talk to the network card, or you want to talk to a hard drive controller. So all of these things also have to happen, once again, through a separate part of the bus unit. So where am I going with this? The point is, <laughs> there is a lot going on. It's incredibly complex. Right? Once again, this is a diagram for a 30-year-old CPU. And we can sort of figure out what's going on here, um, but there's still so much stuff. Right? There's immense complexity hidden behind the wonderful world of assembly instructions and Java code and high-level stuff and all of your wonderful frameworks that make you productive. Just hide away a lot of that complexity. There's layers upon layers upon layers of abstraction, and it's sometimes worthwhile to kind of peel off a few layers and, and see what's underneath because it makes you understand the machine better, which makes you more effective software engineers. Final thing before we get to the more meaty bits. Um, CPUs generally have uh, what are called either execution units or functional units, depending on the terminology. Now, once again, this is very oversimplified, but fundamentally you see three kind of types of units within a CPU. You have the LU, uh, which is the arithmetic logic unit. It's like the core of the CPU, the thing that does the work, does calculations, memory access, conditions, flow control, tests, all that stuff. You have the FPU, which is sort of the complement that deals with floating point numbers. So it's floats and doubles and all the complexity there. You have your memory management unit, which deals with memory mapping, right? If you've ever used memory mapped files, that is, you know, that fundamentally goes through this unit. Virtual memory, paging, access control, you know, if you get a seg fault because you used some JNI library that is, like, if, if you used uh, gzip stream in Java, for, you know, for any length of time, sooner or later, your process is going to crash with some weird seg fault and a core dump because there are occasional bugs there. So if the, the zlib library writes memory to a wrong address, boom, the memory management unit sees that, it triggers a fault, it triggers what is called a trap in the CPU that ends up being routed to user code for error handling, but fundamentally this is the unit responsible for that. Right. Let's talk a little bit about what this, what this looks like in practice. Like as a CPU designer, which I'm not, but <laughs> if I had been a CPU designer, the first thing I'd look at is this, right? This is sequential execution. So we have our, our kind of five basic steps of dealing with any given instruction, and we can do it sequentially, right? We have five steps. We read in the next instruction. We have five steps, on and on and on and on. So the latency here would be, for this hypothetical CPU, would be five CPU cycles. Because for every cycle, every clock cycle of the CPU, it can only do one thing. And that thing is either to fetch the instruction or to code it or execute it, whatnot. So the throughput here is pretty low, right? We have 0.2 instructions per CPU cycle that we're actually 
uh, executing. And old CPUs like the 8086 actually kind of had that, that mode of operation. So one obvious kind of optimization that you can do, and indeed C most CPUs actually uh, do on top of that, is to pipeline the thing, right? There is still nothing parallelized. You don't have multiple cores or anything. This entire talk, in fact, is going to ignore the prospect of multiple cores or multiple CPUs, because that just adds a whole bunch of complexity anyway. Uh, so within a given CPU, within a given CPU core, you can pipeline this, right? You have different, uh, different physical transistors on your CPU die responsible for different things, and you can operate them concurrently. So you might want to you know, fetch and decode all at once. Maybe you can execute the instruction while decoding the next one. Right? You can basically feed more stuff into the execution units of the CPU and try to get to the point where there is always work to be done because you've already prepared the work in advance. If you can do that in parallel, you get perfect pipelining, and then for the same CPU, you have the same latency. It still takes five cycles to fully execute an instruction, but you can actually execute, or what is called retire an instruction every cycle. So your throughput can increase however many fold, depending on the design of the CPU. Right? This is very, very basic, and it seems like a wonderful optimization, but it has some issues, because you will notice that I did not use the term parallel, but I did use the term concurrent. Things are happening concurrently on the CPU. So two instructions may not execute in parallel, but a lot of different things can happen concurrently. And as you know, with anything that's concurrent, you have concurrency issues. You have race conditions, you have deadlocks. So fundamentally, engineering a CPU is no different. You need to find out what these are, and you need to add mechanisms to deal with them. Synchronization, or wait states, or various things, the same way you would do in a high-level language. This is called pipeline stalling. A pipeline can stall. This can happen in really one of three conditions. The first is memory access, which isn't a bullet point in this slide, because we're going to be getting to it in more detail later. Uh, but it can happen with branches. So if you take this very, very simple if statement, right? if i is less than 0, increase i, otherwise decrease i. right? Fairly simple, pointless, but simple. Um, if, we, if we sort of try to break it down into hypothetical assembly instructions, you might have a memory load, right? You need to read in the value of i. Next, you would have a test. You need to actually check if i is greater than or lesser than zero. Then you would have a conditional jump. And then what? Right? You don't really know what happens next because you don't know on which side of the branch uh, your, your program progresses, right? The CPU actually needs to read the data to figure out what the next instruction is. So it doesn't really know what to do. So what happens in this case? Well, the CPU has to wait. It has to wait for the results of, the, of previous executions in order to progress. This is called the pipeline stall, and it slows you down. You don't want that if you can avoid it. The second thing that can happen is with in dependent instructions. So here we have Two statements, we increase the value of i, then we read it in, add one to it, and write it to a completely different variable. There is obviously a dependency between these two instructions. Right? The result of the first instruction determines the result of the second instruction. So if you break it down into, um, you know, into the things that happen on the CPU as far as assembly um, instructions are concerned, you need to, you don't actually have to load, increment, and write back, okay? Most modern CPUs have an increment memory address instruction, so it's just one instruction. Um, but you do need to load that value off of memory, add one to it, and then write it back to that second variable as part of the second statement. So if we, if we kind of take a look at what's going on in the CPU, we fetch the first instruction. While decoding it, we fetch the next one. While executing it, we're decoding the second instruction and fetching the third one. So we're feeding the pipeline as fast and you know as fast as we can, trying to get the CPU to be as effective and efficient as possible. And then we have some memory access on the first instruction. And at this point, i has been incremented, or at least, or rather, we have the incremented value of i, but we have not written it back to memory at this point. So. The next thing that happens is we have two dependent instructions. One is trying to write back the value of i. One is trying to read in 
the value of i for the next statement. Which happens first? Right? If you get them out of order, you're screwed. That's a race condition. If you, write, if you read in the value of i before actually writing the incremented value, then the second instruction is completely invalid. It's going to give you the wrong result, which is an issue for a Java program, but is catastrophic for a CPU. Right? Those kinds of mistakes blow up spaceships. So something needs to happen. There needs to be some mechanism within the CPU to actually deal with this one way or another. And uh, with CPUs, typically uh, what, would, what you would get is you would get a stall. Also, the third instruction, regardless of what order you do those operations in, the third instruction has to wait because it can't actually do anything until it has the result of the memory read. So it literally just sits there doing nothing until the result of the computation is complete. This slows down the execution of your program. Uh, if you come from a more academic background, this is not called pipeline, pipeline stalling, and academics usually call it bubbling for weird reasons that I could never quite figure out. Up to them. Any questions so far? This has all been background. Now we're getting to, hopefully, the good stuff. Right. Practical ramifications. Okay. Where can you actually see the effects of these kinds of designs in your software? So I've mentioned before that one of the, uh, one of the three reasons of pipeline stalling is um, memory access. And the fact of the matter is that despite of what you've been told, memory is very, very slow compared to your CPU. And by memory, I don't mean tape drives and I don't mean hard drives. No, I mean like actual, you know, double data rate, three, 800, sticks of RAM that you have inside your servers. It's actually very, very slow. So for a very modern kind of system, by which I mean Skylake CPUs, you know, very modern kind of Xeons or Core i7s, RAM access is in the vicinity of 60 nanoseconds. Right? It doesn't sound like much until you take into account that for a 4 gigahertz 64-bit CPU, one CPU cycle is 0 0.33 to the infinity number of threes uh, nanoseconds, right? So the CPU actually operates around 200 times faster than your main memory at just one core. Also, obviously, it has more than one core, so it can do multiple things at once, but never mind that. So what this means is that if you access memory, memory completely at random, right? you just pick a random address, say, give me the bit over there, and you do that consistently, um, this amounts to 250, 200 to 250 wasted CPU cycles for every memory read. So whereas your CPU could do 250 units of computation, uh, it's just sitting there waiting, which obviously is not very efficient. And more importantly, if you do this naively, you have a 64-bit CPU. So for every memory access, typically you would be able to read eight bytes in. This accounts for about 130 megabytes of random bandwidth. Now, I don't know, I don't know if this kind of sinks in. 130 megabytes is nothing per second. It's just nothing. If you take a, a, a picture with your iPhone, just the raw data moving through the, you know, moving from the sensor to the iPhone CPU before it gets compressed and goes to storage is around 30 megabytes, right? So 130 is ridiculous. And modern CPUs actually provide you with more in line of six gigabytes per second bandwidth. So obviously we're missing something, right? Surely we can do better. There is, you know, some mechanism within the CPU that guarantees us way, way, way faster memory access than we would get for completely naive random access to main memory. And that mechanism is the CPU cache. So the CPU cache is not a monolithic thing, right? It's, it's a hierarchy of caches. Typically, um, they're, they're called levels, level one cache, level two, level three, etc. Modern CPUs might even have level four caches. Uh, the difference between the levels is as you get kind of further away from the CPU, caches tend to get slower, but much bigger. And there are various reasons for this that have to do with cost of on-die transistors. The level one cache has to run at the same clock speed as the CPU, which is expensive to produce. I don't have the details, but the fact of the matter is, for a modern, perfectly modern Skylake CPU, you get three levels of cache. The level one cache is divided into instruction cache and a data cache. It's 
for various reasons, including historical ones, and it's 64K in size, which doesn't sound like much, except that the access time is four to five CPU cycles, so that would be about one nanosecond. The level two cache is also on die. It's 256K. Typically, each CPU core has its own level two cache, and the access time is in the vicinity of three to seven nanoseconds. Level three cache for modern CPUs is typically shared between the CPU cores, which means that there needs to be some synchronization protocol to actually access it, same as you would have shared memory between multiple threads, is four megabytes in size for a modern CPU and takes 11 to 20 nanoseconds to access. And all of that is there so that you don't actually have to spend 60 nanoseconds to go to main memory every single time you do memory access, because that is slow. Now, as with anything, you don't really, like CPUs don't care about bits, right? They don't care about a single bit. Single bit is not interesting. If you're going to go through the address unit and the bus unit and out to main memory and the memory control and all of that complexity, you're not doing it to read off, to read one bit of memory. That's just ridiculous. You have a certain, certain amount of bits dedicated to that. Um, a, a, an atomic unit within a CPU cache is called a cache line. Okay, CPUs do not deal with any, any amount of memory that is smaller than a, C, than a cache line. So if you're reading one bit for a modern CPU, you're actually reading 64 bytes of main memory. Um, there is a very simple eviction policy. Like if you've ever implemented even the simplest of caches, you would know this one. It's least recently used. So hot memory like memory that is used very often remains in cache, the rest gets thrown away, gets evicted. So why is sequential access so fast, right? If we have 130 megabyte of random band per second of random bandwidth, how is it that we can actually read six to nine gigabytes of memory per second on a modern CPU? The mechanism is called the cache prefetcher. <coughs> Sorry about that. If you have um, an algorithm or a piece of code that reads data and it reads it sequentially, or in some cases not necessarily sequentially, I'm going to get back to that in a second, then you, know, you have a bunch of memory that you have already read and processed, and then you have this chunk of memory that you're currently in the process of reading in and doing some computation on top of. Uh, there is a mechanism within the CPU that looks at memory access, literally watches the stream of memory, memory addresses that are being accessed, and tries to find patterns. And the simplest pattern is sequential access. Like if it sees that you uh, started at address 0 and you read address 1, moving on, it can figure out that, hey, you must be reading memory sequentially, so ideally, you, know, you would want to be able to do computation as fast as possible. Now what this means is that it can actually prefetch memory, prefetch literally cache lines from main memory and pre-populate the cache before the execution units actually get to that point in the computation. Now, because it's a separate unit and it, it works in full memory bandwidth, it can actually read in memory typically way faster than whatever computation you're performing runs, which means that your computation can proceed as fast as it wants because the memory is already there in cache, populated, and waiting for the computation to proceed. Modern processors, modern cache prefetchers, um, are actually significantly more complex and smarter than what I described. They can recognize memory access in what is called strides, right? So if you have memory access that is not fully sequential, but does have a consistent pattern, like you're reading from memory in, I don't know, 1K increments, you're accessing a word here, then you add 1K to it, you read, you read, you read, you read, they can actually detect that and pre-populate the cache as well. So there's a lot of inherent complexity and a lot of smarts that went into trying to uh, hide away the fact that memory access is very slow compared to actually doing computation on the CPU. Uh, this has been progressing very fast over the last 30 years, so whereas uh, most kind of early Intel CPUs either had no prefetch unit or a very simple one. Modern ones have incredibly complex uh, units that can detect various types of memory access patterns and actually uh, make it appear as though main memory is significantly faster than it is. So, 
How would this affect your code? Let's take this image of a weird cat and rotate it by 90 degrees. This is not actually a rotation, this is a transposition, but let's leave that aside for now. Okay, this is the same principle as transposing a matrix. So depending on the type of work you do, right, if you work on like high level kind of server code in Java uh, and you're running the serverless API or you know, doing something uh, more modern and nicer, um, this might seem a little bit remote to you, but actually, regardless of what it is that you do, you're probably using libraries without even realizing it that do have these concerns, right? That do need very fast things. If you're doing any kind of image manipulation, you might be using image magic or you might be using Intel's IPP library. Um, those are heavily optimized libraries that take these effects into account. So if we want to just take the image and rotate it, uh, this would be the algorithm. Right? We're iterating over the rows. We're, oh, I can actually use the laser pointer, maybe. Does it, does it show? No. We'll stick to words. Um, we're iterating over the rows. We're iterating over the columns. We're taking the pixel at x psic y, uh, sorry, at, at uh, coordinate uh, column x row y, and we're writing it to a pixel at coordinate column Y, row X, right? So this is pretty straightforward. And this is essentially the algorithm. There's no complexity here. Now, as it turns out, this is very, very, very inefficient. And the reason why this is very inefficient is because you might be reading from the image sequentially, like this, from left to right, but you're actually not writing sequentially writing in strides. So for every sequential read, you actually have to jump through a whole bunch of memory to figure out where to write the pixel to. So what this means is uh, there is no fundamental difference as far as the cache is concerned, whether it has to read memory or write memory. It still has to have that copy of the cache line within the CPU cache. So this causes a lot of thrashing. Right, you have the, the CPU cache line representing the first row, maybe, or part of it. And then you have, you know, you have writes to various places in memory, and the cache is all over the place. It can't do its job effectively. Um, the, the kind of technical reason for this is that you are accessing memory simultaneously using different strides. Stride is the word that is commonly used to define the delta in memory address from one axis to the next. And what we have here are two separate strides. One is one byte or one 32-bit um, integer, say, which makes it very sequential. And one is the size of a row, which makes it not very sequential. And the worst case wins, because we're doing it simultaneously. So this turns out to be highly inefficient. And this brings us into the realm of what is called cache-friendly algorithms. So one way of dealing with this, and this is what actually most kind of linear algebra or image manipulation libraries actually do, is to use, uh, uh, to use a technique called tiling or blocking. And what this means is that you don't process the image you know, sequentially. You don't process every row, then the next row, then the next row sequentially. What you do is you divide the image up into tiles, into blocks, say 16 by 16 pixels, for instance. And then the algorithm looks something like this. Right? The inner loop is essentially the same, but you add outer loops that actually maintain blocks. Right? You, you process the image in 16 by 16 blocks. You process a block, you move to the one to the right of it, then you move to the, you know, you finish a row of blocks, you move to the next row of blocks, you just do the same kind of processing in a different order. And the reason this is effective is because it limits uh, the cache thrashing, right? It allows the, the CPU cache to be a lot more efficient in what it does for this particular algorithm. So even for a, an extremely naive implementation that literally does two multiplications per pixel, you don't actually do that in, in high-performance code, but for the purposes of this example, it's good enough. You can see that even with an incredibly naive um, implementation in Java, no less, that does things like bounds checking for array access and all of, all of those nice things that um, mean that you get an exception and not a seg fault if you screwed up, um, you still have quite a significant difference. So what we have here are four versions of the same algorithm. We have the naive one, 
which takes about 43 milliseconds on this particular laptop right here to uh, process a 4K resolution image of a cat. And then you have the various tile versions for various tile sizes. So for 8 by 8 pixels, it takes 20 milliseconds. 16 by 16 seems to be the sweet spot for this particular CPU. And it takes 18 milliseconds. The details are not important. What is important is that even a, a very, very naive and simple optimization that took all of two minutes of searching through Wikipedia and five minutes of actual work in IntelliJ IDEA, uh, we get a 2.37 times speed up. Right, this is a significant speed up, and there's probably a lot more, like much higher speed ups that we could gain, but you know, I couldn't be bothered to spend the time because that is not the point. So we have here a just just by recognizing the way that CPUs are kind of designed and the way that they work, and not changing anything fundamental about how I represent the image or the language that I write in. I don't have any C code or assembly or JNI or anything of the sort, we still get a, an almost two and a half times speed up. Right? So this is significant. And even if you don't write code that is affected by this, you are using libraries that do this a lot. Right? Netty, for instance, has a lot of kind of uh, cache aware and, and thread aware optimizations that take the CPU design into account. So that they can actually push your HTTP requests faster over the wire. Any questions on this? Yes. Uh, I can repeat it for the camera, or we can wait for the mic. Hmm? This one? So I can see. Uh, we we might also not assign by and bx to zero, but assign it to x and y. Um, would it uh, uh, speed up a bit, or it's a kind of optimization that handled automatically by JIT? Or um, this well, you you could do that, but then you would have to have the same arithmetic for defining the the condition of the loop. But those are like you may see some some improvement by kind of shifting the arithmetic around and maybe having less computation, like less additions or less multiplications, uh, and it will help, but not as much as the cache optimization because the thing that kills this algorithm is memory access, not computation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I, okay. I, I thought maybe such uh, kind of optimizations that I propose. Uh, maybe in real world, world they are handled by JIT compiler or, or something. Uh, the JIT compiler does a lot of these things for you. I can't guarantee that it actually performs any of the optimizations that you might care to mention in this code. But like I said, it's a matter of degrees, right? You may be able to outsmart the jitter and do some things a little bit better. The effect, the total effect of those optimizations that you might make will generally be significantly smaller than just a slightly smarter or cache aware algorithm in this case. But certainly there are things you can do, right? This is far from being the most efficient way of, of rotating images. It's just an example. Okay. So, any other questions about caching at this point? No. Cool. Okay, let's, let's take a look at another effect. And the effect is branching, right? So what is a CPU branch? Effectively, you have a condition, you evaluate the condition, the condition evaluates to a Boolean true or false, and then depending on that condition, you go left or right. What do I mean by left or right? You basically jump to this part of the code or, or that part of the code, right? That is a branch. Now, Branches are problematic because the, the determination of whether or not you go left or right when you have a branch uh, depends on input, right? It depends on the actual data at play. The CPU generally cannot assume that it's going to be this way or that way. But the CPU doesn't, like, we don't want the CPU to actually wait for that data to become available because then we get a pipeline stall. And stalling the pipeline basically means that the CPU is just sitting there waiting, right? That is effectively the same as why you might want to do asynchronous, like asynchronous architectures, event-driven architectures instead of threading, because you don't want to waste CPU resources if you can avoid it. So 
maybe the CPU can take an educated guess, right? Maybe it can, it can look at your code and say, okay, well, I'm gonna guess that we have to go that way. And maybe the guess can be, you know, not just the flip of a coin, maybe the guess, the guess can be smart. Maybe it can be, um, maybe the, the guess can be based on historical data. So for a given inner loop, maybe the CPU can keep track of which way, in which direction a, a particular branch tends to go and then speculate on it, right? Speculative execution is a big thing. It's a big thing in Java. It's a big thing on the JVM, on the CLR, and any, any kind of engineering uh, process. This is called branch prediction. And bra branch prediction is... In, in CPU terms relatively new. It's been around for about 25 years, and it's gotten a hell of a lot smarter over the last 10 years. But what, what fundamentally branch prediction means is that the CPU will concurrently, once again, there is this concurrency thing, right? The CPU will, at the same time, speculate which side of the branch is going to be the, the, the relevant one, but it will also evaluate the result of the, of the condition so that it can make sure. And you can think of it as, as like a database transaction. Optimistic locking, right? I'm gonna guess that nothing has changed and I have a condition that guarantees that if something has changed, it fails my transaction and then I can try again. Optimistic locking in a nutshell is very similar to branch prediction because the CPU can guess which side of the branch to go to. It can start prefetching instructions and decoding them and possibly even executing them. And as long as it can roll back the work, if the result of evaluating the condition turns out to be wrong, then we're safe. As long as it's transactional, from the outside, everything looks perfect, but code can run way faster. So what I mean by commit, committing this transaction, is the CPU speculates, it, it makes a, an educated guess, it goes off and starts executing the code on that side of the branch while waiting for the result of the condition. If the result of the condition turns out to be the same as the guess, then we commit the transaction, which basically means we can go on working and nothing needs to happen and things run smoothly. If the result of that condition turns out to be the opposite of what the CPU guessed, then we need to kind of roll back the transaction which in technical terms means flushing the pipeline, which means throwing away all of the work that's been done so far and go jumping to the right side of the condition, fetching the instruction, etc. Now, the reason this is called flushing the pipeline is because if the CPU gets strong and it did not bother fetching the instruction on the, on the side of the branch that it guessed would not be relevant, then it has to start the execution all over again. It has to start the pipeline for that particular side of the branch from scratch, which means that it loses all of the work that, it's, that it could have hypothetically done so far, and latency increases. So that's also a form of pipeline stall. So, going back to our conundrum, right? We have the code here uh, that we started off with, and I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to take an educated guess about what's causing, um, well, what's causing is kind of obvious in context, right? But I mean, why is it that branch prediction is so effective in this particular case? So you get 10 seconds, don't bother shouting it out, it's just for your own edification. What is wrong with this picture? What piece of code causes, causes this issue and why? 10 seconds, go. <laughs> yeah, so as you might expect from context, and as some of you have guessed ahead of time, it really is about branch prediction, right? Branch prediction is responsible for the results that we've seen. But it's worth figuring out why, right? Because just saying branch prediction is kind of the same as saying, well, the database is slow, maybe I need to you know, increase the buffer pool size. No. That is stupid. You need to figure out what is going on. You need to get metrics out. You need to understand the problem. Then you can devise a proper solution for it. So in this case, what happens is this. We have an array of bytes, varying values all over the place. Now we sort it, right? This is the array after sorting. Now what happens is, if you remember the original bit of code, our, our condition was if the element at position i is greater than or equal to zero or lesser than, it's the same thing. Now, 
what this means is that the element with a value of zero in this case becomes kind of a pivot point. On the left side of it, we can flat out say that this condition is always false. We will never have a positive or even zero number to the left of the zero. On the other hand, on the right side of it, it's always true by definition. Right? And it's the same thing, like I, I could have, this is, this is simple, but I could, have, um, I could have had the same example with, say, if it's greater than or equal to seven. It would have had the same effect because the sort guarantees that the branching always goes on to one side on the left hand of that element and to the other branch on the right side of that element. So what we've effectively created here is a pathologically wonderful case for branch prediction. Right, the branch predictor runs through our loop and starts gathering data, right? So maybe it can't do any optimization for the first however many iterations, but consistently it sees that we're always going to the left side of the branch. So at that point, it can speculate really, really well. Then at some point, it's inverted, right? At some point, it reaches zero. Suddenly, it goes to the right side of the branch. Okay, fine. We get a pipeline stall for one or two or ten elements within our array. But from that point on, it can always speculate on the right side of the branch with perfect success, right? So this is the perfect scenario for branch prediction. And as you've seen at the beginning, there is an order of magnitude difference between speculating correctly and not being able to speculate at all. So this is how big an effect uh, the design of the CPU can have on the performance of the exact same code that, like, I'm not, you know, I'm not cheating here, right? You can download the source, you can see for yourself. The jitter emits the exact same code in both cases. It's the data that matters, right? So data locality, caching, uh, uh, the, the shape of the data uh, as, it, as it kind of uh, reflects on your algorithm matters a lot to the performance of your code. And even if these effects are not necessarily things you see in your day-to-day -day work, I flat out guarantee that every single person in this room is either writing code like this or using a library that uses code like this, right? Because these effects are huge. So if you have any kind of fundamentally computationally, um, computationally bound load, CPU-bound computation load, then these things become really, really important. And even, like I said, even if you do high-level software development, you're running on top of Netty or you're running on top of the Linux kernel, right? These things, uh, you know, the, the lower-level kind of data structures and algorithms have to take these things into account or else we'll all be running basically at the performance of 20 or 30 years ago. With that, I'm roughly done. Um, you will get, obviously get the slides. Uh, for those interested, there is some further reading. There's a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, you, can, you can take a picture, but it's probably easier to just get the slides and you know, just, just link to them. Um, and with that, if you want the source code for these benchmarks, it's over there on GitHub. Uh, also, I think uh, Martin Thompson from Real Logic also has a whole bunch of benchmarks showcasing various CPU effects based on JMH in Java. So it's really interesting to take a look at. And are there any questions? Well, there is one. I smell heckling. Uh, no, just simple question. Do you use sometimes things like print assembly or just try to stick to and try to understand what's happening only on Java level? I try to do both. Um, generally speaking, I, I also work in the server space, and I work in an even higher level language. I work in Scala. So generally speaking, I don't have to think about these things. The whole point of this is that there's huge complexity under the hood so that you don't have to care. Right? The reason why most of you probably either kind of sort of knew this or have not ever run into this is because the whole idea is for you to be productive without giving a crap. Um, in my case, I'm interested and occasionally also have opportunity to work on high performance code. So I have dug deep into JIT assembly output, which is crazy, by the way. Like the amount of complexity in the assembly output of your jitter will take you by surprise no matter how much you think you know about the JVM. Um, but also, I try to understand these things so that, you know, so that I don't write bad code. It's kind of the same as if you can get away with an atomic integer, for instance, that is almost 
assuredly better than having a mutex or, or a synchronized block or whatever. These are things that you know you may not necessarily understand the fundamentals of it, but I think having like a, a solid grounding in what's under the hood makes you better software developers, even if you don't have to think about it or use those techniques most of the time. So I have had opportunity to do both, um, and I cannot recommend going through the assembly output of the jitter, simply because <laughs> there is limited benefit to be had, and it's incredibly complex. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, enjoy what's left of the conference. Cheers.